Our speaker this evening is an acclaimed scholar of arts and letters, an experienced educator, and an insightful cultural critic. Dr. Anthony Esselin is a prolific author with over 1,500 articles in both scholarly and general interest journals. A senior editor of Touchstone, a journal of mere Christianity and Chronicles magazine, Dr. Esselin is known for his elegant essays on the faith and for his clear social commentaries. His articles appear regularly in Crisis, First Things, Inside the Vatican, Public Discourse, The Catholic Thing, The Magnificat, and others. He's the author of more than 30 books and is known for his acclaimed three-volume verse translation of Dante's Divine Comedy. His own book-length sacred poem, The Hundredfold, Songs for the Lord, is a unified poem composed of original lyrics, dramatic monologues, and hymns. Professor Esselin is a frequent speaker at colleges and church and civic institutions and currently serves as Distinguished Professor of Literature at Thales College in Wake Forest, North Carolina. For more from Dr. Esselin, you can visit his online magazine, Word and Song, at anthonyesselin.com. It is a great honor to welcome back to the Institute, Dr. Anthony Esselin. Dr. Esselin, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. It's always great to be here. I love these. Uh, uh, I, I love this time. I get to talk to so many friendly people and uh, full of intelligent questions. And it's just just wonderful thing. ICC is wonderful. Let's begin with a prayer. And since uh, uh, one of the things we have to talk about uh, today is the status of someone in this poem who is called Father of Gods and Men, um, not like the Father we know, so let's say the Our Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. One of these days, I would like to uh, show to folks at the ICC that that um, that I just um, recited, the Lord's Prayer, is actually a Semitic poem. Um, it's it's uh, six or seven verses of Semitic poetry, um, and not the only uh, not the only such poem in the New Testament that's kind of flickering behind um, the Greek prose. Uh, okay, so before I start here today, I want to tell a story. Uh, in order to set this poem in its uh, in its cultural context and to give us some leading themes as uh, we talk about the Iliad in in the weeks to come, this, this tonight and our next two sessions, here's the deal. Okay, some uh, some time in the second millennium BC. Okay, um, a group of uh, people, <laughs> uh, hordes of people, who had already made their way uh, in, into various parts of um, of Asia and of Europe, okay, came down into the Greek world, right? Um, they are the, they were the, they are the ancestors of all those of us who speak an Indo-European language, they came from the steppes of Russia, uh, and they moved south into India, Persia, and then India. They moved southwest into the Mediterranean world, west into the Western Mediterranean world, west and north into Western Europe as far as the Scandinavian countries, okay? And all of the languages that uh, have descended from this group. Um, our, our cousins, distant cousins it may be, but still cousins. For instance, Hindu is a cousin of English. Persian is not an Arabic language. Uh, Persian is an Indo-European language. The people of Iran speak a language that is distantly related to English and not to Arabic. Um, in any case, they brought with them when they came down, they were restless and dynamic people, and they brought with them a system of gods 
that was not like, not exactly like the systems that were already present in the Mediterranean world. The Mediterranean world, at least we can guess from uh, uh, weird survivals of these things, where the Indo-Europeans came, and um, well-known survivals where they did not come. Um, the people in the Mediterranean basin seem to uh, have fertility religions of one fashion or another um, that were associated with the bl with blood, okay, uh, and with the earth, with the womb and the tomb. Uh, hence, human sacrifice in some of the fertility religions. Um, Moloch, the worship of Moloch, is one such, okay, peculiarly nasty such, um, but uh, characteristic of certain Semites, the Phoenicians. Uh, who then became very powerful, moved to Carthage, and were Rome's chief rival. Um, where they came, though, they brought their system of gods that did not have to do with planting things in the ground. It's where they came from, they were, uh, they, they did some planting, but not large-scale agriculture. Uh, they were herders, and, and they came down with a system of gods that focused on the sky. And if you can imagine what it's like in the steppes of Russia, there aren't any trees. Um, you have this great, it's like living in Kansas, if Kansas were 10 times as big as it is. Um, you have this vast open sky. They associated their gods with that sky. Um, and as they came down into Greece, okay, um, they, the people who came down supplanted the people who already lived there. Okay, they didn't obliterate them. They didn't wipe them out. They took over. Uh, and they took over with their religion too. And yet the older fertility religion, uh, a, a, a kind of a gruesome and ghastly sort of thing associated with things coming up out of the earth, um, survived, all right? Um, it survived in a suppressed form, okay? Now, um, this is why this is important here. I just try to follow me on this, okay? Um, the, uh, uh, the, there was there is no historical record of this happening, but it enters a cultural memory as a myth, as a story of how a younger generation of gods supplanted an older generation of gods. Okay, and uh, this was uh, largely the work of Zeus, but not only the work of Zeus. Okay. Zeus supplanted his father, Cronus, who had supplanted his own father. Um, and uh, the old gods that were hideous and grotesque often um, and ruled by sheer brute force are now taken over by what, a, a, a god who is essentially a maneuverer, a politician, who needs both cunning and force okay combined and zeus doesn't simply uh, overthrow the older generation of gods he's not powerful enough to do that it's remembered in this way okay they have no idea what happened centuries before but it enters cultural memories this that zeus made crucial alliances with some of the older and hideous gods the titans the previous generation, to side with him. So um, Zeus, with these cunning alliances, manages to put together uh, a, a force that overcomes and suppresses the older generation of God. doesn't kill them. Now, um, so what we end up here is a syst with, with this is a system of um, governance by the younger generation. They are strong, but they are also cunning. They are sometimes, not reliably, but sometimes rational, okay? They are gods of intelligence, okay? Um, and it's assumed that if human beings are to have any kind of a decent life, somehow they must model themselves after the politician god, Zeus, um, that is, they must combine both intellect and force, okay? 
they must then know how to talk, right? Um, Zeus does not simply will whatever he wills. He has to sometimes wheedle, um, sometimes intimidate, um, sometimes keep an eye on things, uh, especially if for a time his back is turned, all right? Now, the reason why this is uh, really interesting in Greece is that that's the kind of system that the Greeks developed for their own selves. And um, I don't think that this is just a matter of sheer chance. You've got to try to imagine what the terrain of Greece is like. Now, Greece here, when I'm talking about Greece, I'm not just talking about the mainland. I'm talking about all the islands in the Aegean Sea and about um, various uh, lands across the Aegean Sea in Asia Minor. OK, um, it, the, the Greek, the Grecian peninsula is largely mountainous. It doesn't possess a whole lot of arable land. So the Greeks are going to have to uh, be the early Greek, the ancient, the prehistoric Greeks, the ones who are memorialized in part in the Iliad, will do some part time marauding of other peoples. OK, because they, there's not enough arable land to raise everything that they did on their own. But they're also going to become merchants and craftsmen and traders okay they do have um they do have hillsides where the olive and the grape can grow and uh with the surplus that they have generally of wine and olive oil and their uh seafaring abilities their island hopping um they can do trade with other cultures and this also fertilizes them culturally because they come in contact with all kinds of people well, the point is, though, that the that the Greeks, um, this is a very hard land for any single power broker to gain hold of and keep. OK, it's um, the places are too much divided and the people, though they speak largely the same language or dialects of the same language, they become fiercely proud of their little locales, their cities. Each city you must think of as kind of county. Right. With, with maybe a central city and even a citadel inside the central city. But the outlying territories too also belong to the city. If you're an Athenian in ancient Greece, it does not mean that you live in the city of Athens. It means that you live in the polis called Athens. You can be living on the seacoast or inland in the farmland in the countryside, or you can actually be living in the city um, within the city walls. All right. Um, any of those and you're, you're an Athenian. Athe Athens about the size of Rhode Island, uh, the whole Athenian state, maybe somewhat bigger. It was the, uh, in territory, it was the largest of the uh, Greek um, city states. OK, but um, th they, they didn't have the martial capacity to take over everything. But also the Greeks didn't want that because um, because they developed in their in these little semi isolated and semi-autonomous cells, they develop their own ways of living, their own ways of getting things done. Um, and in order to do this, in order to make it work, um, you've got to have uh, all able-bodied men between, let's say, the ages of 20 and 50 um, capable of taking up arms. Um, you don't have any of these places. It's large enough to have a standing professional army. OK, that means that citizens take up arms. But that means if you're going to take up arms, that you have a right to have a say in what goes on in your city state. Um, some of them will be more democratic than others. Some of them have kings. Some of them have councils. Some have both. You know, there's a variety of ways of doing things, each place with their own laws, and yet somehow this common overarching culture. And the thing was, somehow, somehow to combine those two crucial uh, features that we find in Mr. Zeus, who is not a creator, okay, Right. I mean, there was a time when Zeus didn't even exist because he was born. All right. But he is called the father of gods and men because he has the prime authority and he ha he wields the prime authority um, so long 
as he can uh, keep everybody else in line, and that includes his own passions, all right, which he has. In fact, all the gods have. Um, the gods are conceived as like human beings in this regard. Um, they've got these dark and unruly passions, ever threatening to break forth in glory or bloodshed or treachery or folly, all kinds of things, okay? But they've also got reason, cunning, intellect, and somehow these things have got to be brought together into, into harmony. Otherwise, there's no possibility of having a polis at all, okay? Um, and the Iliad shows, among other things, see, the, 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 um, one more little thing here. The Iliad, the people mentioned in the Iliad, if they existed, existed in the second millennium B.C., okay, coming from Mycenae, which by, had been taken over by these migrants that came down from the steppes of Russia. And the people of Mycenae, uh, they, were, they were rich, they had lots of gold, they did some trade, they did some of their own agriculture and herding, and they also were marauders. Um, so what we're probably remembering somehow or other in the Iliad is a raid on a rich Asian city, not an Indo-European city, not a Greek city. But in, in the myth, it's remembered as just like other Greek cities, okay, um, called Troy, which did exist and which was destroyed, uh, obliterated sometime around 1300 BC, okay? But the Iliad itself dates from many centuries later as legends of this are told, are preserved, names of people and places are preserved um, by oral traditions spanning hundreds of years. And a poet who we call Homer, tradition calls Homer, and tradition holds that he was blind, okay, um, composed this poem, no doubt weaving together strands of songs that he had himself had inherited into this tapestry of, um, of warfare and meditation on what it means to be a human being especially what it means to be a human being in uh, society. And all societies seem always to be perilously on the edge of breakdown, um, held, together by <clears throat> held together by wisdom and courage, uh, but always threatened by folly and treachery and passions from within and invaders from without, but the threats from within uh, are often more dreadful than threats from without, okay? Um, somehow, uh, these things have got to come into a working order. Um, you will not obliterate the passions. Dark as they are, you can't obliterate them. They're there and you better acknowledge them and sometimes even give them free reign, but ultimately they have to be governed. Otherwise, chaos and destruction, death, okay? Um, so with that in mind, uh, uh, Homer, is, is, Homer is composing this poem when the political, political structure that I, I mentioned, the polis, the, the, the city-states, governing themselves. That's already come into existence. It's, it's there. It's not totally developed yet, but it's there. And so when he imagines what it's like to be a city or frankly, what it's like to be an army, an army it's his own experience in, let's say, the 800s BC, not 1400 BC, but 700 BC, 800 BC. Um, it's his experience, what life is like then, that guides him. OK, and now we can see um, what the heck is going on at the beginning of this uh, at the beginning of this epic. Um, the key word at the very beginning is the opening word in Greek, rage. OK. 
Um, <clears throat> rage. That is not a propitious word. Okay. Um, let's uh, if, uh, just in translation here. Uh, see how Mr. Fitzgerald has translated it. Uh, anger be now your song, immortal one. Achilles' anger doomed and ruinous that caused the Achaeans' loss on bitter loss and crowded brave souls into the undergloom, leaving so many dead men, carrion for dogs and birds, and the will of Zeus was done. Begin it when the two men first contending broke with one another, Lord Marshal Agamemnon Atreus' son, and Prince Achilles. I'm just going to pronounce them according to their uh, uh, more common pronunciations rather than Achilles. Um, just a, if you want to hear it in Greek, uh, just a few lines here. Um, it just sounds like this. This is in very strict meter so that hundreds and hundreds of lines could be committed to memory and were committed to memory for centuries by singers of these songs before anybody actually said, you know, we better write these down. Okay. They were not written down until the time of Aristotle. <laughs> Ex u de ta pro te de este tene resante, a traedes terax andron kai dius achilles. Rage, sing, goddess, of Achilles the son of Peleus, the horrible rage that sent so many of the, that brought so many of the Achaeans pain and sent many brave souls down to Hades, souls of heroes. Um, that became, uh, their bodies became a feast for dogs and birds, while the will of Theos, um, Zeus, the d divine one, by the way, that is cognate with our, our English word Tuesday, the two part of it, to the German god, same, okay, um, while that will was done from the first time that they stood in strife. Um, Atreides, that is, Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, the lord of men and divine Achilles. Brilliant Achilles. Dios means bright and shining. Okay. And there's a key word. Um, it's rage. All right. Rage. That doesn't bode well. Okay. Um, and you think, oh, rage, well, he's sending a lot of his enemies down to hell. No, uh, here in the paragraph, he's sending a lot of Greeks down to hell. Not because he kills them, but because his rage makes him stay out of the battle so that they will be killed. Okay. His own people or his own allies killed. All right. And the one person who he's closest to among all the fighters, will be killed, okay? Uh, his rage, his rage, right? Um, made their bodies to be pecked at by dogs and birds. Uh, so you get the two, Agamemnon and Achilles, and um, a situation develops right at the beginning of the Iliad. It's a political situation, okay? And it should be resolved by political sense um there's a priest of apollo crises he uh belongs to uh people who are allied with troy all right but his daughter has been taken captive by the greeks so he goes to the greek camp and um, he offers uh, quite a big ransom. Um, basically, he's acting as a traitor, okay, in order to get his daughter back, right? So he's turned his back on Troy. He's not a Trojan, but he's an ally. He's turned his back on him, he's, but he, he wants his daughter. Daughter means everything to him. 
but the daughter is now sharing the bed of Achilles. He's part of the winnings in war. Uh, sorry, not Achilles, uh, Ag Agamemnon. Agamemnon. And um, that just happens to be. And this old man, and he's a priest of Apollo, comes to the Greek camp with a hefty ransom and asks for his daughter back. Agamemnon has authority, but he's greedy, and he's sometimes insecure. He's jealous of his authority. That is, he doesn't want anybody else to have the upper hand over. But he is the acknowledged leader of the whole army. Okay. And he can't find it in himself to figure out a way to give that daughter back to the old man and not lose face among the Achaeans. Right? Uh, to look as if he's a weakling, that's more than he can bear. But this is what he does instead. Okay. But Agamemnon would not, because on page, our page six here, it went against his desire. And brutally he ordered the man away. Let me not find you. Uh, you know, I, I think you can kind of do this like uh, uh, with the accent maybe of a mop boss, you know. Uh, let me not find you uh, here by the long ships, loitering this time or returning later, old man. If I do, the staff and ribbons of the god will fail you. Uh, give up the girl. I swear she'll grow old at home in Argos, far from her own country, working my loom and visiting my bed. Leave me in peace and go while you can in safety. Or uh, as uh, Nick, the bartender in uh, uh, one, It's a Wonderful Life in the Bad, Pottersville says, Look at me, I'm making angels. Chink, right? Oh, hey, old man. I get you here again. And your staff of Apollo won't protect you. And as for your daughter, she's coming back with me to Hoboken. Huh. <laughs> to Argos, where she's going to share my bed. And she's going to work at the loom. What do you think of that, old man? This is a colossal blunder. This uh, is the uh, cynical bishop, who I don't even know if he believed in God, Talleyrand, said uh, about something, I, I don't know if it was what Napoleon, famous statement, I think it was something that Napoleon did, uh, he was an advisor to Napoleon, he, he, he said, it, it was worse than a crime, it was a blunder. Um, this here is worse than a crime. It's a blunder. Uh, and a crisis has already played a card in, in this, right? He says, um, let me have my daughter back for ransom as you revere Apollo, son of Zeus. And I don't know why... Um, it's not here. I should check in the Greek text, but it's Apollo who shoots from far away. All right. Apollo is the archer god. And if you anger him, you're asking for uh, bad things to happen unforeseen. Now, uh, this is another case where these the, the ancient religion has been overlaid by um, the newer, younger set of deities, but... In the in the single person of Apollo, you get you get that kind of sandwich. All right, you get that the overlay even in one person because though he is the bright archer god and the god of poetry and song, he is also and this might have been a holdover from the religion of the natives who were taken over. Uh, he is also the god of mice and plague. Creepy little things from the ground. And um, it's 
it's with his name, maybe the ancient name of a completely different god, but it's with his name, Smintheus, that Crises then appeals. Um, the god of mice, the god of plague. They didn't know how you caught plague, but they were wise enough to know you got it from mice and rats. And um, there's Crises. Avenge me, avenge me! If ever in any grove I roofed the shrine, I burnt thigh bones and fat upon your altar, bullock or goat flesh, let my wish come true. Your arrows on the Danans for my tears. And Apollo says, you got it, pal. <laughs> Twang. And uh, dogs and horses get the plague first, and then the, then the human beings start getting it. All right. It's the left and right. Um, you've got uh, you've got people dying. And Agamemnon, who is supposed to be the chief of this army. Now think of the army as you would think of a city state. If you think of a polis, it has a government and people get together in council to discuss what should be done, right? Hence, it's much to be valued. If you've got somebody in your group who is of long experience, okay, such as the old man Nestor, or who is really intelligent and shrewd, such as Odysseus, okay, rather than being a hothead, uh, and, um, This is going on, and nobody has the guts to confront Agamemnon. Everybody's got to be thinking. We think everybody's got to be thinking. Why is this happening? Okay. And uh, Achilles, the young Achilles, strongest of all the fighters on the Greek side, he says, uh, slyly, but also temperately at least for the time being um but it is sly agamemnon now i take it the siege is broken we're gonna sail and even so may not leave death behind if war spares anyone disease will take him we might though ask some priest or some diviner even some fellow good at dreams for dreams come down from zeus as well why all this anger of the god apollo now, do you think for a moment that anybody in that council is unaware of why Apollo would be angry? So this is a direct confrontation of Achilles to Agamemnon, but it's couched in a way that would, might give Agamemnon an out if he chooses to take it, but he doesn't, right? Um, so Calchas comes forward, and Calchas, Agamemnon hates him. Uh, Calchas has uh, been the, you know, the, the prophet that sent them on this voyage to begin with. Um, and it's Calchas now who is uh, uh, fingered by Achilles and says, okay, you Calchas, you tell us. I have no idea what it could possibly be, but you're, you're a priest, Calchas, you tell us. Okay. See how all the maneuvering is going on here, and uh, uh, it's easy to say, well, Agamemnon should back down. If Agamemnon backs down in a way that causes him to lose face, that's a big loss for the army, because there's nobody to step in and take his place. Okay. But then you would be a body without a head. Um, somehow it's got to get done, though, but it doesn't get done. Achilles, um, uh, Calchas says to Achilles, and notice, see what's going on underneath here. And this sort of thing is characteristic of the whole poem. You read it and you say, oh, it's an adventure tale. Oh, no, 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 yeah, it's an adventure tale. It's also a tale that's really cunning in its politics, and lots of things are implied. Achilles, dear to Zeus, it is on me you call to tell you why the archer god is angry. Well, I can tell you. Are you listening? 
swear by heaven that you will back me and defend me because I fear my answer will enrage a man with power in Argos, one whose word Achaean troops obey. A great man in his rage is formidable for underlings, though he may keep it down. He cherishes the burning in his belly until a reckoning day. Think well if you will save me. Now, everybody understands what's going on here. And a uh, thing to do would be, if you're Agamemnon, to somehow defuse this situation. But it's getting worse and worse. The more it goes on, the worse it gets. And uh, Achilles says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, Calcas. I'll tell you what. I will back you up. I will have your back. You discover the truth. I'll have your back. Doesn't matter. Does not matter who it is. Who your words might anger, even if it is Agamemnon, though he ranks the first of all the Achaeans. Even if, who knows? Even if it's Agamemnon. And of course, that is what it is. Okay. Um, and uh, Calchas says, you got to give the girl back. Okay. You take the ransom, you give the girl back. Um, actually, take you're not even going to get the ransom now uh restored to her father freely with no demand for ransom and then we offer up a hecatomb uh at crisis only then can we calm him and persuade him uh so now agamemnon has dug a big hole he finished and sat down the son of atreus ruler of the great plain agamemnon rose furious Because now he's really up against it. He's been uh, shown to be heedless and grasping. And he's been embarrassed in front of the chiefs of the army by Achilles. And he can't have that and remain who he is. So he has to demand that the Greeks supply him with something to compensate him for giving up the girl. And Achilles says, where are you going to get that from? All the plunder has been parceled out already. Um, we'll, the next time we take plunder, uh, we'll give you the triple the share. But you can't ask people to give up now. And um, again, um, <laughs> he's, He's, he's backed into a corner, and instead of finding a way that Nestor would find or Odysseus would find, he, um, he digs deeper and says, oh, really? I'm the lord of this army here. I could take anybody's prize. I could take Ajax's prize. I could take Odysseus's prize. I'm going to take your prize, Achilles. Now, uh, it's, a, it's a cunning and, um, though I think, ineffective political move that he makes there. Why say Ajax and, Agamemnon, uh, and Odysseus? Why say, if not to issue a veiled threat? All right. If I don't take Achilles' prize, I'm going to take yours. Um, in order to drive a wedge between uh, Achilles and Ajax, or Achilles and Odysseus, or Odysseus and Ajax. And this is not what a capable governor does, all right? But he's painted himself into this corner through his rage and his impatience and his insecurity, his jealousy. Um, and, uh, you know, it gets even worse because Achilles say, okay, you take her. All right. And he, he's ready to kill Agamemnon, but he's prevented from that, uh, from doing that by one of the gods. Right. Um, Athena pulls his hair. Don't do that. And Achilles says, you know, I do all the worst fighting for you. And this isn't even my battle. I am not the one who's uh, whose wife got stolen by a pretty boy. Uh, I, I, this is not my fight. 
to hell with you, okay? I'm going to my tents. I and my friends and all of us Myrmidons, you go fight them. You go fight by yourself. I hope Hector mows you down. I hope you lie bleeding all over the field by the thousands, and you'll know better than to offend me. So there he is, youthful, frank, brave, generous, hot-headed, stubborn. Okay? Um, it's all those things rolled up in one. And deadly. Um, but deadly now in a rage that's going to redound upon himself, uh, as we're going to see. Um, now, you might ask, or to see, I'm uh, doing too much, not getting far enough, but you, you, you might ask, why are they even fighting to begin with? And um, this is the deal here, okay? Um, just as Zeus, this is more of this, the story, right? Uh, just as Zeus had supplanted his father, Cronus, uh, so there was a prophecy that Zeus um, or somebody would give birth to a son. So, uh, sorry, some yeah, some goddess would give birth to a son who was greater than his father. Now, if that happened to be a son of Zeus, we're in big trouble because that means war again. All right, um, the one person alive knows the secret, and it's Prometheus. But Prometheus. Um, of, of the older generation of gods, but very cunning, very smart, has earned Zeus's wrath. And uh, Zeus has chained Prometheus to uh, one of the mountains in the Caucasus, and a, li a, a vulture comes every day to eat his liver. Um, uh, he, Zeus trying to force Prometheus to tell the secret, okay? Um, but Prometheus won't. Only when Zeus relents... Right. Only when, in fact, he allows something other than brute force to guide his footsteps in this, does Prometheus tell. And in fact, it's the goddess Thetis who is going to bear a son who is greater than his father. And just in the nick of time, because Zeus, who um, likes to make love to anything that walks on two legs, um, Zeus was <laughs> Zeus, Zeus was about to uh, make love to Thetis. And Whenever Zeus makes love to anyone, um, any any female that is, uh, a pregnancy inevitably results. Right, it's automatic. Um, so they they just barely e evade this by a hair's breadth, and uh, so they marry Thetis off to um, a king of a place called Thea. Um, she's Peleus is his name. And uh, she gives birth to Achilles. Okay, but at the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, all of the gods are there to celebrate because we didn't really want another. We didn't want everything to be blown up into chaos all over again. Um, so they're there to celebrate the hair's breadth escape when reason got the better of passion finally. Um, and they invite all the gods and goddesses except for the goddess Strife. You don't want to invite her to a wedding, okay? But she gets her nose out of joint, so she fashions a golden apple with the inscription for the fairest and tosses that apple in the midst of the feasting gods and goddesses. And that is when Hera, the queen, right, Zeus's consort, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and Athena, the goddess of wisdom, daughter of Zeus, sprung from the side of his head. They all decided that apple's for me. And so there is strife. And in order to settle the strife, they need an umpire. And that's when they go to Mount Ida. That is Mount Ida, not in Crete, but in Troy. There were two Mount Idas. This one's in Troy. And they find a young shepherd there tending the flocks of his father Priam. He is a prince of the realm. His name is Paris or Alexandros. And the goddesses, see, to think of this, right? Um, the goddesses are acting the parts of corrupt politicians. Um, they don't 
want to let it rest in his own judgment, they bribe him. They try to bribe him. And Hera bribes him with power, and Athena with wisdom, and Aphrodite, chuckling to herself, says, come here, kid. Forget about them. I'll give you the most beautiful one in the world. And Paris says, girl, you got it. Unfortunately, the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen, was already married, which Aphrodite neglected to tell Paris. But he, he sails then to um, uh, Sparta, uh, where uh, uh, Menelaus is been married to Helen. And he's young and handsome, and Menelaus is a bit of a doof, okay? Um, and uh, uh, in, one, uh, in one telling of the tale, Menelaus decides it's time to go on a business trip to Egypt or something like that. You don't want a pretty boy alone with your young wife while you go on a business trip. But in any case, Paris absconds with Helen, and um, uh, uh, Menelaus calls upon all the great chiefs of Greece there, to unite with him because they had all promised that whoever Helen would choose, because they all wanted her, whoever Helen would choose, um, they would come to his defense if anybody ever tried to take her from him, right? They swore an oath, and now they're all bound by the oath. That's why they're all in Troy, okay? Uh, because passion, all right, lost got the better of Helen and Paris. And because of this, we have war for 10 years and thousands and thousands of people on both sides dead. All right. And uh, throughout the, at least the first half of this poem, we are wondering why the heck do we keep hold of Helen anyway? Okay. Uh, why not send her back and be done with this? That's in fact suggested. Paris will have none of it. Uh, and Paris often is too busy uh, making love with Helen while everybody else is fighting on his behalf. Okay. Um, what do you do? What do you do? You're stuck, right? Uh, he's your brother, if you're Hector. Um, he's your son, if you're Priam. Uh, it was unjust. I mean, you don't do that to your get to your host okay uh clearly a crime right um but if you just hand him over to his enemies that's cowardly uh you know, so you can't do that you're again you're you feel yourself kind of stuck um and unfortunately maybe the noblest person in the whole poem is stuck uh and it's it's hector um, Hector does not call Helen any nasty names, okay? He actually likes her. Um, Hector, who is very severe with his brother, Paris. Uh, Hector, you, you get the feeling that although he's, he's a great warrior, there's more, he loves more things than just war. That's not the whole of Hector. And, and so, although I've been talking about uh, uh, politics and life um, in that kind of uh, political organization that we call the polis, we really see it um, in a very specific form only in Troy, because Troy is the only polis that we visit at all, all right? And uh, towards the end of our reading for today, um, Hector goes into the city of Troy, okay? There's still some fighting going on in the fields. He goes into the city, uh, that is, he goes inside the city walls, and um, he meets women, okay? This whole thing started over a woman, and in fact, the, the, the rift between Agamemnon and Achilles happens because of stubbornness, stupidity, and so forth, that is centered around a woman, centered around the passion of love or lust, um, and, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting the the kind of progression that we get with Hector meeting the women here, because the women are just as much a part of the polis as the men are. Now, 
it's nonsense to say to the ancient Greeks, boy, you were a bunch of really rotten people because you didn't let your women vote. The, who's voting for anything anyplace else in the world? Okay. Um, nobody, right? I mean, they, they had come up with these this interesting way of life, okay, that uh, relied upon um, the... Um, I'll be answering questions very soon. It relied upon uh, the citizen soldier. Okay. Um, anyway, but they're as much a part of the polis as anybody. They they're part of its life. Okay. Uh, and uh, so he's there to plead with his mother to get all the women to uh, offer prayers and promises of sacrifice to the goddess Athena, because Athena has been against them. Um, and he she used to be for them, but she's against them now. And uh, the mother, the mother Hecuba or Hecuba, uh, I used to do her as a, a you know, uh, a Jewish mother, you know. Oh, Hector, Hector, why do you always have to be out there in the battle? Let some of the other boys fight for the time. Come inside and rest your feet, Hector. I give you something to eat. Come, Hector, you know. Um, and he says, Ma, Ma. If I let you feed me, I'm not going to want to go back out there. And I got to go back out there, Mom. They tell you what you do, Mom. They tell you what you do. You get all the other women and you go You go to the shrine there, uh, uh, Palace Athena shrine, and you pray, okay? Oh, back to, back to, oh, Mom, I can't, I can't do it, Mom. He, we have the feeling that he would like to, and he knows full well that if he does, he's not going to go back outside, right? And then he goes, where Paris has ducked out of the war and he's there with Helen and Helen actually doing work uh, while Paris is polishing his spear, you know, uh, and uh, he, he has sharp words for his brother and Helen has sharp words for him too. We get the feeling that Helen, you know, uh, she, uh, she married a bit of adult and now she has traded a bit of adult, not that he's really stupid, but, you know, a bit slow on the uptake. Uh, she traded that for a bit of a coward. Not that Paris can't be brave at times, but, you know, she may be getting a little bit tired of, of this business there. And she knows that she is hated by a lot of people in Troy, obviously. But Hector doesn't hate her, and Hector, Hector actually treats her with courtesy. Um, and then he goes and he sees his wife, Andromache. And Andromache has not been home. She's been up on the ramparts looking out at the battle. She's worried. She's worried about her husband. She's worried especially because she knows what will happen to her. If the city is taken and she survives, she'll be carted off into slavery. And slavery, right? I mean, you kill all the men who are uh, aged to bear arms. You kill them all. Uh, you have to. Um, you and you enslave everybody else. It means all the children and the women, um, and uh, it's a hard life. Okay, uh, and she has that to look forward to if the city falls. And Hector says, "This is the this is the one thing that hurts me most, to think that this can happen." And he has a presentiment. He says, "I know that Ilium. I know that Troy will fall." In the meantime, there. There she is with the servant girl and the little baby boy. The little baby boy is called Scamandrios, after the name of one of the rivers that passes by Troy. But uh, the people have given him a, a more um, fancy, a more glorious nickname, Astianax, which means Lord of the Citadel. Um, Astianax, Astianax. Um, and uh, it's Anax that is typically used of Agamemnon in this poem. He is the Anax Andron. He is the lord or the chieftain of men. And so there's a little baby boy who is named by the people uh, fondly a Stinax, chieftain of the citadel. And he's so little that when dad is there and he, dad, Hector comes to take him in his hands, the baby sees the crest on Hector's helmet and it's nodding up and down and it scares him and he starts to cry. 
at which point, now see how, how subtle this all is, at which point Hector laughs, and Andromache laughs, and Hector takes off his helmet. Right? He takes off that instrument of war. He puts it on the ground. The baby settles down, and he takes the baby boy in his arms, and he says, I hope that you grow up to be a better man than I am. This is what every father wants, right? That they'll say of you, his father was really good, but this one's better. Um, he dandles him in his arms. It's a beautiful, beautiful human moment between a father and a little baby son. We will have more to say about fathers and sons uh, next time. But uh, I think that Homer assumes that his audience knew what was going to happen to that little boy. He's not going to survive the war. Um, in one version of the story, he's thrown to his death from the ramparts. Okay. And this is behind the, you know, you this, as you watch this and they don't know, but we do what's going to happen. All right. And there is Hector trying to be both the warrior and the man of the city, a family man too. Um, and there's a, a sort of fullness of human life there that we don't get in the tents of Agamemnon or in the tents of Achilles. And yet Hector, uh, Homer is taking the Greek side you would think, and not the Trojans. Anyway, um, enough for right now, and I'm going to take five, okay, and come back and you ask me questions, right? We have about a half an hour, 40 minutes or so, okay? So I will be back in five minutes. Yes, you ready for some questions, Dr. Esselin? I'm ready. Wonderful. Okay, so the first question, because a couple of people wrote in a little apprehensive about reading this. Um, we got a question, why is it so important to read about Zeus? And why would I wanna read about taking women hostage and lust driven leaders and you know all of this sort of evil pagan stuff? What is the value in a Catholic reading this story, the Iliad? Oh gee, I hadn't. I I actually did not expect a question uh, on that order. Um, I suppose uh, because I teach literature, I take for granted that that all great works of human art uh, warrant our respect, and um, especially the greatest works of human art and poetry may be the greatest of all human arts uh, warrant not only respect, but deserve our, our attention or study. Um, the, the, the Iliad, the Iliad is a poem that tells truths about human nature. Uh, they are, of course, not the whole truth, but then it, what, what work of art can we expect to get the entire truth about man um, to be uh, explored or revealed or even apprehended in some way um still uh, the uh uh the peculiar situation of the, of the ancient greeks ought to be kept in mind that is these are the people that um bequeathed to us an ideal of political self-government um that I mean, still, it repays returning to them to see the kinds of things they confronted, the errors they made, but also the triumphs that they enjoyed. Uh, what they saw perhaps more clearly than we do, because things were relatively new to them, what they saw as uh, in, in much need of attention, okay, um, this is the kind of thing that has to be done if you are going to have a self-governing city rather than chaos or rather than a city that breaks up into civil faction, civil strife. Um, we can't pretend that everybody is going to be nice 
everybody is not going to be nice. Okay. Um, there are going to be bad people. And within the human soul, there are going to be unruly tendencies. Um, there are going to be passions that if we indulge, we indulge them to our destruction. But those passions are not going to go away. You can't pretend that they're not there. Um, they have somehow to be dealt with. And uh, the, the Greeks, whether in their poetry, their, their ancient heroic poetry, such as the Iliad, or in their political philosophy, or in their history, okay, the Greeks... Uh, and, and their art, too. Their art and architecture express this, too. They're coming up against that problem over and over again. So, for instance, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the favorite things to portray in uh, uh, Greek architecture was the uh, mythical battle between the, the centaurs and a human clan called the Lapithae, the Lapiths. Um, there was a wedding and uh, somebody made the mistake of inviting the nearby centaurs. Oh, well, centaurs are half human, half beast. And sometimes the beast prevails. And the centaurs at the wedding got drunk. And one of the centaurs tried to make off with the bride. And uh, that began a bloody fray, okay? Um, chaos and bloodshed erupted at the wedding. And what's often portrayed is Apollo, what, that's one of the younger gods descending from on high with his arm outstretched to put an end to the business. Okay. Um, and you put this in prominent places, things like this too. You put them in prominent places of public worship. And your public worship tends to be outdoors, Greece. Why would you want to be indoors in Greece? You know, uh, outdoors in the porticos. And then you're looking at that. And what you're looking at, what you're looking at, is held out to mankind as a possibility, okay? It's not a certainty. And it's, uh, it, it, it is, it, it's not sentimental. Uh, it is not easy. Um, as I said, these passions don't go away by a magic wand or just by wishing. They're there, okay? Um, the dark undercurrent of human nature is there, and the Greeks had to confront it in the only, in the ways they knew. Okay, um, not I mean, the philosophers are going to try to confront it. Okay, but before the philosophers ever came around, before the political philosophers especially came around, the Greeks, in their own political actions, tried to come to terms with it, um, to somehow since the passions could not be obliterated, you wouldn't even want to obliterate them, to somehow tame them, or if not tame them, at least put them in check sometimes, or channel them, use them for the good of the city, okay? That's a tricky thing. Um, and the possibility is there, but it's always precarious. And uh, gosh, it's good to be around uh, artists who are honest about this. Um, and, uh, you know, just don't, I mean, especially about the passion of love, uh, the passion of love. I'm not talking about agape here. I'm not talking about Christian charity. I'm talking about the passion um, who don't just smile and say, well, you know, it's love and love makes everything right. No, it doesn't. Okay. Okay. Uh, a Aphrodite um, is uh, not a warrior goddess, but she causes a lot of harm. And we see it, all right? Uh, so, you know, but that's why. I mean, the, the Greeks, they were ideally positioned culturally and geographically to develop philosophy, to develop what we now know as politics. Um, and because each little place, right, was its own little laboratory, cultural and political laboratory, you came up with different possibilities of a solution that this place tried, this place tried, that place tried, that place tried. And they, were constantly, they were aware of each other's laws, too. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's a, they're a fascinating people. It was kind of a, a so unique historical and cultural geographical accident. 
that gave us uh, the city-states of, uh, of ancient Greece. Um, and uh, that's behind the early city-state that's behind this poem. And we're the inheritors of that. So I think it repays study. Also to note how, uh, how, how, how different um, the Hebrew way of looking at things will be, which is not to say that the Greeks were entirely wrong. Um, it's good for us sometimes to meet with really intelligent people struggling against what we would now call original sin um, and having no better way to deal with it than through political maneuvering, checkmates, stalemates, so forth. Uh, right? Uh, it's, this is what happens <laughs> with original sin syndrome when uh, those passions are given free reign. Very interesting. Um, another question that came in, Dr. Esselin, is asking about the tone. Um, this uh, this participant was saying that that the translator um, that that he was reading called it merriment, um, and was wondering what you think of that, or is this more serious in tone? And what is sort of Homer's perspective on war in general? Homer is. Uh, we might say the greatest war poet who ever lived and the greatest anti-war poet who ever lived. He does not have an ideology, okay? But he will present to us war in its fullness, which involves great sorrow, great suffering, great pain, great wastage, but also courage and excitement and, dare I say, fun. Um, the, the great warriors, Diomedes, uh, Achilles, Patroclus, Hector, will have their days in battle where everything goes their way. And then it seems like there's nothing better in the world that uh, a, a human being can experience than to be glorious on the battlefield like that. Um, that's... We're talking about a man with a very, very big imagination here, and a, a, a man who who is honest. Okay, and I, I, ideology doesn't keep him from saying things that he 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 grasps with his mind. Um, these guys would not be doing this if, on some level, it were not enjoyable. And there is some—I don't know if I'd call it mirth. Uh, I might call it a fierce delight uh, in, in the poem and not just a, a little bit here and a little bit there, but running as an inconsistent thread throughout. Uh, but at, in the end, uh, vanishing entirely. Uh it's it's a poem with a lot of gusto. Maybe that is a better word to use than merriment. Um, it, there is delight in battle, and it's fierce. It's ferocious. Okay. Um, it's not the kind of thing that you will actually find much of in the Old Testament. Uh, it's here, and uh, you know, tell the story to the Plains Indians in the uh, 19th century. They'd understand it, um, or the Iroquois, or the Apaches. They'd understand. Uh, they, they'd understand. Yes, it's glorious. It's fun. What do you want? Uh, it's mankind. What do you want? <laughs> you know, <laughs> original sin disorder. Yep, that's a good point. Adrian here on screen. Why don't you uh, go ahead and ask your question? Thank you, Dr. Esselin. Um, so I have two questions. Okay. My first one is, why is Agamemnon in charge when Menelaus is seeking to bring back Helen? And how could Diomedes wound Aphrodite? <laughs> uh, we, uh, <laughs> as for the second question, we don't have developed any um, clear uh, physical uh, 
sense of what a god is. They're sort of physical, okay? Otherwise, you can't make love to them, right? I mean, these gods and goddesses are always making love to human beings, right? Aeneas is, for instance, uh, the son of uh, Aphrodite and his father Anchises, okay? Um, goddess born. Uh, they, they're, they're, you know, sort of quasi-physical at least, and so she could be wounded, but she doesn't bleed. And she's immortal. She can't be killed. Um, you know, the, the blood doesn't come out, but Ichor. Uh, that, that, the first question was, um, uh, that was Diomedes wounding Aphrodite. The first, was your first question was... Why is Agamemnon in charge? Oh, oh right, right. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> Agamemnon is presented as... Uh, more intelligent, more forceful, uh, more decisive by far than his brother Menelaus. Uh, Menelaus is kind of sluggish, okay? He's he's a good guy. I'm not saying anything bad about him. And he's I, I said he was a bit of adult. I, I didn't mean that he was stupid. It's just a little bit a little bit it's just a little bit unmanly, a little bit indecisive, okay. You're not entirely surprised that Helen got kind of bored with him, all right? Uh, Agamemnon is, partly he's the chief of all because uh, he was selected as the chief of all. Uh, partly he does have a kind of authoritative manner. Now, it doesn't come off very well all the time, um, but he's the sort of guy who seems to take for granted that he has to be in charge and that he deserves to be in charge and he's going to be in charge. And uh, this gives him something that even Achilles doesn't have. Now, it doesn't mean that he's going to be good as a leader. But he's just formed for it. All right. Uh, and Achilles himself doesn't even doubt that. If that, if that can answer. There's a, there's a quality there. And it's given by Zeus. It's a gift. Unfortunately, he doesn't give Agamemnon uh, the, the temperance of Odysseus or the kind of calm wisdom of the old man Nestor. But, you know, the gods don't give all the gifts to everybody. Right? They get some, and you don't get others. Them's the breaks, and you make the best you can of them. <laughs> uh, more questions, please. Yeah, Gordon here on screen. Go ahead, ask your question of Dr. Esselin. My question has to do with this um, this concept of the Olympian gods here. Okay? Yeah. So you know you have the old gods, and then you have the new gods. Then you have this this concept of the Olympian gods that kind of pops up in Greek mythology. Where does the Iliad fit into all this? Well, the Olympian gods are those younger gods, okay? Okay. Uh, and they're associated with the tallest mountain in Greece, Mount Olympus. Um, later on, when the Greeks actually got, you know, kind of used to going up to the top of Mount Olympus, they began to imagine the gods as uh, higher than that, you know? Um, but uh, uh, at Olympus are the younger generation of gods and those allies from the older generation that Zeus bribed to stay with him and not with their own generation because he'd give them really good digs. You know, um, this is the politician. And they said, OK. Uh, and uh, with their great titanic force, he was able to subdue the, the, the older ones, right? Um, it's fascinating how what must have happened as a slow um, migration, invasion, and cultural takeover, okay, without anybody being conscious that this was going on, right? How it is somehow is preserved as a story about generations of gods. Dorothy here on screen. Go ahead and take yourself off of mute. I've read the Iliad many times, and I had never thought of it being so political as you yeah. 
have expressed, and I'm really liking that take on it. Now, my question is um, kind of related to your first question, and it's a little bit of a convoluted thing, but you, your first question, you talk about the Iliad being about the rage of Achilles, which is right. what I had always thought that it was mostly focusing it on. Is. But during your talk, you also mentioned that Agamemnon is also in a rage in yep. this first council that they have, and that, that this is affecting the things that, that take place because he's trying to save face and so right. forth. Um, I was a little curious about two things. One is, I guess we need to stay in books one through eight. Uh, yeah, yeah. But who else do you see as being um, driven by anger in this part of the Iliad? And do you think, because I was also fascinated when you pointed out, I guess it's obvious, but I hadn't thought of it before either, that we only see the Trojans inside of the polis, inside of a right. city. And right. it seems like the that the Trojans are presented as more considered, more um, almost like as, as more civilized than the Greeks outside. Do you yeah, we see- get to see them. We get to see them in their own home. Yeah. Do you see the Trojans as being less driven by rage than the Greeks? It seems to be the case in the poem anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Homer, uh, Homer's Greek, and we're, we're, we assume that we're taking the side of the Greeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. And so he say. goes way out of his way to stack the deck in favor of the enemy, the Trojans. Um, we, we see it occasionally in all of the warriors when they have their best day. Um, Hector, when he has his best day on the field, is implacable, um, is, is motivated by sheer fury and delight in killing. And that's Hector, who may be the finest human being in the poem, okay? Uh, finest among the warriors, anyhow. Uh, Diomedes has his day. Patroclus has his half a day. Um, it's, it's always there in everybody as a possibility. And it's a dangerous possibility. But you, you can't say, well, we just will never act. We will never be angry. For the Greeks, that's... That's an impossibility, okay? Uh, they have no answer to the problem of original sin, uh, as we would call it. Um, they know that man is often more like a centaur than like a god. And uh, yet there is always the possibility that you can keep the centaur in check or use the centaur, or use that anger um, for, <sighs> for destruction that does well for your city. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not meant to be a pretty poem. But boy, it does, I think, get at some truths that are not easy for us to acknowledge. Uh, and and he's wonderful. He doesn't. You you wonder. Does this man ever take sides? Well, he does. I think he does. Uh, uh, um, implicitly, he does. He does level judgment at his characters, but it, the judgment is left m deeply implicit. I think he's characterized Hector as someone we ought to admire, and Achilles we ought to admire. But there's a big qualification there, and we are going to get to that next time. Um, uh, rage <laughs> sends everybody down to hell. Thank you. Um, Dr. Esselin, a question about Helen. Um, she seems to express some regret. Oh, yeah. Would you say? Does she have the ability to go back? Could she have fixed this? 
Uh, on her own, I don't think she could have fixed it. Um, I don't know. Let me think about that. I, I uh, It's not presented to us as a live possibility that Helen could just walk out of the city gates. Um, first of all, they'd have to be opened for her. Uh, and you don't open the gates um, unless they're under strict guard. Uh, that's why you need a tr the horse to get inside the gates, right? Anyway, um, you got to be wary of Helen in both the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, she is, n Menelaus is no match for her. He should have never married her, okay? Um, she can uh, do cunning things that run rings around them, right? And she's a very good talker. Now, I don't know whether we're to view all that she says as insincere. I don't read it that way. But on the other hand, it's the kind of thing that you might say in order to win favor from people who you know are probably sick to death of you to say, oh, this is all my fault. I'm such a female dog. Um, I should never have been born. Okay, Helen. Uh, <laughs> right. That's very nice, Helen. Um, we may know that in one telling of this story, after Paris dies on the battlefield, Achilles is dead, Paris is dead. Uh, she's going to marry again before she goes back to Menelaus. Okay. <laughs> she's going to be husband in between, whom she's going to betray. Uh, Deiphobus. Um, Helen is a woman to be reckoned with. Her sister, Clytemnestra, is Agamemnon's wife. And she is going to murder him when he comes back. Um, because she's taken a lover in his absence. Uh, don't marry into that family. <laughs> I was going to say, that's quite a pair. Oh, my, oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Well, finally, Dr. Esselin, uh, next time that we are together, we'll be reading books 9 through 16. Is there anything that you would encourage us to to keep in mind in terms of themes or what to watch out for? Just um, well, as one, one thing as a heads up from, from now on. Now pay very close attention, since I've brought it up with Hector and the little baby boy. Pay close attention to fathers and sons. Okay. Um, Achilles has a father back across the sea and he's aging Peleus his father uh Achilles has a father figure that is kind of foster father the 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 slave who brought him up in his father's household his name is Phoenix Phoenix is there uh with the army so he's a kind of he's a father figure and Odysseus and Phoenix and Ajax three very different people will come to appeal to Achilles. Um, and the name of Achilles' father will come up. Okay. Um, that's an important thing. We are going to find out that Achilles has a dreadful choice to make. He has two uh, courses of life open to him, two possibilities. And he's going to make his choice. We're left to wonder whether it's the correct choice. And it, too, will have to do with uh, a father, the, the love that he has for his father, or the love that he does not have for his father, or something else that is more important to him, right? Um, so pay, pay, pay close attention to that. Uh, the father, the big father, in the last half of the poem, is going to be Priam, of course. Hector's father. Okay. Um, so keep 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 a lookout for that. And keep a lookout for that uh the big scene in the middle of the poem, I'll just right in the middle of the poem, where we have uh an embassy sent to Achilles. It's essentially a political thing to try to work out some kind of realliance and compromise, some way to get him back. Okay. Um, and that embassy is going to fail.
right? We'll, we'll, we'll be talking about that especially. So I guess uh, it's time to sign off. God bless you all. We'll see you uh, at the end of the month. Would you mind closing us in prayer? Yes, uh, I would not mind. No, I would not. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Saint Therese of Lisieux, pray for us. Amen.